Welcome everyone to today's Campus Town Hall. We appreciate that everyone's busy, but it's good to take a hour out of our day and to get updates from campus leaders. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function uh, for today's speakers. And if your question is not answered, you can send it after today's presentation to vca at berkeley.edu and we will get someone to answer and get back to you. With that, please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor of Administration, Mark Fisher. Mark? Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today. I hope your spring semester is going well. Today, we're honored to have a number of campus leaders with updates on current topics, followed by our keynote speaker, Chancellor Christ. We will hear from our Chief People and Culture Officer, Eugene Whitlock, about the status of working remotely and what the eventual return to campus will look like. This is a very timely topic. Our Chief Information Officer, Jen Stringer, will update us on the security breach at UCOP, which we learned about last week, share some other updates, and encourage all of you to um, uh, sign up for the Experian benefit that's been offered to us. Associate Vice Chancellor of Capital Projects, John Arvin, and Campus Architect, Wendy Hillis, will update us on the Anchor House Project, designated for University Avenue and Oxford Street, a very generous gift from a donor. Our first speaker is Dr. Guy Nicolette, Assistant Vice Chancellor and the Director of University Health Services, with the latest update on the COVID pandemic and vaccines. Guy. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna share my screen right now. I was asked to give a COVID update, update but I thought I would give um, a, a few more, um, a wider perspective, a, a, a real health update of the campus as we as we enter spring. So, um, and and because I like uh, interactivity, I thought I would start with just a poll, a quiz, if you will. So let's go ahead and launch this um, quiz. There are <laughs> there are wrong answers, but it doesn't matter. You're not being graded on this quiz. So for those, I'll go ahead and read the question in case uh, anybody has a hard time seeing the, the questions. Question one is, how many tests do you think that UHS has performed since the start of the pandemic? Um, the, the choices are on the screen from 2,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 50,000, and on up to more than 200,000. Question two is, how many unique people have been tested? And the third question, how many positive tests do you think we've had at UHS uh, since the start of the pandemic? So I'll wait till all the votes come in. So because the panelists aren't allowed to vote, uh, I'm not seeing any of the updated numbers. I'm hopefully I'll be able to see uh, the, the actual final uh, tally on this or that we're all able to see the final tally on this. But uh, for those that wanted to wait for the information, here's the information that um, we have, uh, as you can see, tested over 26,000 unique individuals, run over 268,000 tests, and had uh, about 1,000 uh, positive cases. Our case rate was extraordinarily low um, if you put it in context of the um, county positive rate, the state positive rate, or certainly the national positive rate. So I've, I've been trying to highlight this, that we've, the, the Berkeley community has been extraordinary in our collective response to COVID and keeping uh, our positivity rate, our clusters and outbreaks low. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm very, I'm very proud of us. And I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that we're starting to see a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Correspondingly, right now, we have very few people in isolation and quarantine. We were expecting a large post-spring break uh, surge, and, and we really didn't see um, anything more than what I've been calling a bump. So again, very promising so far that we um, have, us, have escaped, right for, for now, a large surge. And there's our, our poll results. So most people got it right um, for... for um, most of, well, the question number one, a high percentage got it right. Um, and then question two and three, interesting. Um, so after spring break, 
again, we really have not seen anything more than a bump. And so that leads us really into um, the, I'll call it the next phase of our, um, of our COVID response, which is vaccinations. As you've probably experienced, uh, vaccination rollout was a challenge. It was a challenge locally uh, at the state level and at the national level. The good news is um, we are streamlining our response here locally, and we've, uh, we've been able to, through partnership with the city and the county, um, secure some vaccinations to keep our program rolling. Uh, the next slide is uh, our current, and these, I should have said, these are widely available on our dashboard. Um, if you just Google UHS uh, COVID dashboard, you'll get to this, the six dashboards that we've uh, been producing publicly. One of them is the immunization dashboard that shows that we've fully vaccinated 3,500 um, or so um, UC Berkeley, um, uh, of our UC Berkeley community. And we've um, at partially, at least partially vaccinated about 5,000. And we're, we are expecting some amount of um, COVID uh, vaccine doses, particularly um, for students. Although we have been, um, following up those that we've given first doses to, to make sure that the, everybody receives a second dose. And, and that's of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. We've also been um, told that we're gonna receive Johnson & Johnson, which is a one dose series. So we will really start to increase the pace of our fully vaccinated uh, population here, if all goes well. On the next slide, I, I really just wanna point out that while the rollout has been indeed bumpy, we have applied multiple lenses to our own vaccine rollout. And it, it mattered, age mattered, and um, it, it mattered for, from a, a protect, protection of those at highest risk. But we also did um, look at uh, distribution and vaccine invitations based on other demographic factors, salary tier, et cetera. And you'll see on this slide that um, I've, we've done a reasonably good job at um, con consolidating those factors and, and having a vaccine distribution equity across multiple, um, um, you know, with, with most multiple lenses. That leads me to say that if you've received vaccines through the UHS, we, we know you, we've got your record. If you receive vaccines from outside of UHS, there is an, we now have the ability to um, collect that information securely um, um, and under HIPAA protection through our portal. If you've used the portal before for um, testing, it's the, the same portal, it's just a different tab. Um, go to the immunization tab that I've, I've shown there and um, there's a button that will come up that says update your COVID-19 vaccine. You can click update, upload a picture and the dates of, of the vaccination. Um, and if there ever is a mandate, um, doing this will satisfy that mandate. And it really helps us understand the population vaccination, which is gonna become an increasingly important uh, part of our COVID response is to understand what percentage of, of our population that is vaccinated as we get back to in-person activities. So I, I know I've only got a couple more minutes, but I really did want to highlight other things because I've been very um, excited that we've been able to be mission-driven, maintain our mission even uh, through a pandemic. Um, and, and part of that certainly has been mental health. And we do expect a, a bit of an echo uh, to the pandemic as people come out of um, kind of crisis mode and, and start to realize that they, you know, have, have uh, either been in a short-term or long-term distress because of, because of COVID or because of isolation or because of some of the after effects. Um, we, we really expect to transform our model because frankly, the, uh, the, UA, the UHS and um, U.S. collegiate health model for um, counseling and mental health really 
isn't prepared to, to meet demand that's been increasing now for five to 10 to 15 years. And so we are gonna transform our model. This is a, a, a overly complicated, but, but excellent, frankly, um, graphic representation of, of the model that we're moving to. Um, we were lucky enough to, to hire an expert uh, in, in stepped care and, and now stepped care uh, 2.0 that really takes um, a innovative approach to a, and improves continuity across all levels of care and better matches need and demand uh, to, to level of care and doesn't force everybody into a one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling model. So we're, we're excited about this. Um, we're incorporating a crisis response um, team into the, the thought of this model. And so we're really excited for the, for the future of, of our mental health response on campus. Physical health, we again, maintained our mission. I'm very proud that we were able to uh, maintain our primary care and urgent care uh, services, despite pulling a lot of those clinicians and, and um, uh, physical health team members over to do COVID related things. Um, one, one aspect that I, with my sports medicine background, I, I guess I'm biased to, to highlight that we um, achieved a gold certification from the American College of Sports Medicine in, in exercise as medicine uh, campus. So we, again, tried to maintain our uh, mission, our service, our preventive care, uh, and, and I wanted to highlight that. One of the bigger areas where we have a plenty of opportunity left is um, in our uh, social and environmental health, our infrastructure. Um, folks are feeling video fatigue and, and uh, we really need to in, integrate kind of in-person meetings while maintaining some of the lessons learned about uh, handling business and work and service uh, remotely. Um, I probably should have instituted more quickly at UHS um, things like 50 minute meetings because back to back Zooms are just the norm now and we really um, we're probably not as quick to respond as we should have in anticipating some of the, the uh, mental health and social health um, um, implications of, of uh, the ease with which we can now meet uh, even, even remotely. Um, we need to think differently about spaces. We need to work differently. And I know Eugene's gonna, gonna talk about that. So I, I, I won't go on about that. Um, I will say that I've had this idea for the longest time to close down that Bancroft way and, and make it a green space. And so we, we just have tons of opportunity from the from a health perspective to do things differently. And, and I'll view that as a silver, silver lining of COVID. Um, lastly, looking ahead, we there, there will still likely be um, restrictions to some level on uh, coming from the state and local public health officials. I do not know when they are going to end, particularly masking. Um, I also see we are going to completely uh, flip to a vaccination-based paradigm uh, versus the state blueprint, the uh, purple, red, orange, and yellow tier. And that's already starting to happen with the, with the announcement from the governor about June 15th. Um, mandates for a vaccination. Um, I am not going to be surprised to hear that there is consensus from, from the UCs for a student mandate for vac vaccines. I know that's on the table uh, and we are fully prepared to, to implement and incorporate a, vaccine, a vaccination mandate for students into our regular immunization and, and vaccination program. That will not be challenging to do. Um, lastly, I, I'll just say that, you know, I. I see a campus for fall that might look normal on you know, whatever normal was on, on the outside, but that we will still have um, some restrictions like um, size of, of classes uh, under 200 or some element of surveillance testing and maybe masking. And while I'm very optimistic that we will enter fall um, in, a, in a much better place than we, we um, entered spring, there still might be some um, after effects or some, some things that we are still doing uh, to, to end up the pandemic as we, as we transition from a pandemic to endemic. And so 
while I'm optimistic, I just want to highlight the fact that we might still have some, some things that we, we have to do at, to, to make sure that we really do shift out of a pandemic. I think with that, I'll stop. Mark, thanks for the, for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts. Great, thanks Guy. And I just wanna say that you and everyone sort of involved with the effort around uh, testing, vaccinations, and then just guidance over the last year in terms of the pandemic have just done an extraordinary, um, uh, provided an extraordinary uh, body of work and the effort is really remarkable. Um, next we have Eugene Whitlock. Eugene, are you ready? Yes, I am, absolutely. And I'll do my best to get us back on schedule. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> So, uh, you know, on everybody's mind is what's going to happen between now and the fall. As we all know, in the fall, we expect our students to be back primarily for in-person classes. And so that's going to have implications on staff who will need to be on campus to support basically what I've been calling a reopening of our campus. On top of that, the governor said a couple of days ago that we expect California on June 15th to be open for business. So how do all of those things put together and what are we doing as a campus to prepare? So the first thing I wanna say is we aren't changing the date from when you should expect to return to campus. We told people before through June 30th, you should expect to continue to work remotely. That's not going to change. But sometime after that date and before the start of semester, things are going to change. More likely around the middle of July, there'll be a point in time when we say, hey, everybody come back. Now, what does that mean everybody come back? That doesn't necessarily mean that every individual has to come back and show up for work on that day. What should be happening between now and that point in time in mid-July is that you should be having conversations with your supervisors through the Chief Together or just through conversations to talking about what is my work schedule going to look like for the future? We have a committee called the Future of Work Committee and the deans have a corresponding committee that we're working on campus guidelines and a toolkit to help people for those com through those conversations. But really what we want people to be thinking about is do I need to be on site every day in order to do my job, in order to serve the mission of the university, right? That's gonna be the overriding guiding principle. And if things go as we're planning them to go on track around public health things, that means vaccines are widely available. People can get them if they want them. All of the restrictions have been lifted on gathering. You know, we still may be required to wear masks, but we can at least gather. Then we can see a situation where people can come back to work as normal. One of the big things that's still up in the air is child care and dependent care availability. And so this is also a big limiter for a lot of our population. Half of our employees have minor dependents. And so if summer camps aren't available or if going towards the fall, schools aren't open, everything that we do is going to be you know, look through that lens in terms of if I wanna make somebody, quote unquote, make somebody return to campus, I have to work with that person on their schedule so to make sure that they're still able to do what they have to do because alternative care uh, arrangements aren't available. So when we think about flexible work arrangements in the future, and we will have flexible work arrangements in the future, some of them might be, somebody has a flexible schedule. I start at seven and I finish at three and I go home and pick, the, pick up the kids or I start at seven, I start at eight, I finish at two, I stop for two hours and I pick it up again for another two hours and I'm working from home. Some people may work remotely. Some people may come in one day a week. There are a lot of different combinations that might work depending on the business needs of the unit and the preferences of an individual. And so the, the training and the guide that we'll be rolling out will help people have those conversations and think about what may or may not work for them before decisions are made. We really hope to get this information out into people's hands to use it in June so that you can start making your proposals to your supervisors if you want to work hybrid or if you want to work remotely. Your, your managers can talk with you about that. If you need to request a reasonable accommodation so because you can't come to work on site, we want to give people plenty of time to get that process started. So the, there's a lot going on that individuals have to do. As a campus, there's a lot that we have to do to get ready to welcome people back. So a lot of the buildings have been more or less shut down. We still have a lot of people coming to work every day, but a lot of buildings are more or less dormant and they're not ready for people just to rush in. So we have to figure out what we're gonna do that. We have to give our custodial staff time to do that. And we have to allow people to adjust their schedules to do that. Certain parts of campus have been completely shut down and people were temporarily laid off. So we have to recall workers to get those services ramped up. So there are a lot of moving parts. So for those of you who might expect on June 16th, it's all open for business, just like Governor Newsom said, 
that's just not that's just absolutely not possible because there are too many things that we have to do to make sure that the campus is ready and safe for us to reoccupy it. And so that's so I want to manage expectations. I know we, we were, you know, we in the recent morale survey, 34% of people said, you know, they want to continue working remotely from home. A lot of you probably will be able to remote work remotely. 8% of you said you want to get back. You will have the opportunity to get back, but we all need to be patient and we, we will get there. And I think I will stop there for now. I did that in five minutes. It's okay. <laughs> it was pretty great, Gene, Eugene. You, uh, I think you pick up the time loss. Um, next, everyone, let's welcome uh, Jen Stringer, who's going to bring us up on the crisis du jour. Um, and Jen, are you there? I am here. Thanks, Mark. Um, I appreciate uh, being this being the crisis du jour. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think um, many of you, uh, I hope all of you know that uh, we've had a very serious security breach um, at the office of the president. Uh, the campus and the office of the president itself has been communicating um, with our entire campus community. And rather than go through sort of the details of, um, of the, those communications, what I really wanted to do today is share with you um, what I did last night, which is I got on the Experian website. I entered all of my information, including the information that we are, uh, oftentimes tell you be very careful. Um, don't put your social security number in just any site. Um, but those communications that we have been sending to you, including the Experian code, um, we are encouraging everyone to sit down, do what I did, which is put that information in uh, for myself, um, I sat down with my uh, spouse. I sent that information to my adult children who happen to be beneficiaries on some of my accounts. Um, and I am encouraging all of you to do the same. I'm also encouraging you to share that information with people who work for you, with students, um, just about everyone who honestly has um, some sort of uh, connection with the Berkeley campus um, and with the UC system as a whole, whether they're students, whether they're parents of students, whether they are um, employees, whether they are spouses or minor children of employees, may have been impacted by this particular incident, which is why we are really encouraging folks to sign up for um, the experience service that is being offered uh, currently through uh, the UC Office of the President. I am looking to see if uh, there are any questions um, in the chat, but I will leave it there. And um, again, encourage also managers to give their staff time to do this. It is not easy. Um, and so I, again, we're encouraging people to allow their staff um, to use work time, just like we would if we were um, asking them to do their security training, which we're encouraging you to do as well. Um, if you have um, anyone who has been a beneficiary of um, or listed in any of your paperwork, I would encourage you to have them sign up. So um, if you stepchildren, if you're not a legal guardian, but they were beneficiaries on your retirement account, yes, account, yes, have them sign up for the experience service. Um, again, I, we are casting a wide net at this particular um, point in time. Um, uh, my husband is on my medical plan. Yes, he should sign up for Experian. I have LifeLock. Should you still go to the Experian site? Absolutely. Double coverage is better. Um, so I would encourage you, even if you're using something else, um, to sign up for the Experian service as well. Um, the email did say don't share the enrollment code. That was actually sort of on early advice. The uh, uh, Office of the President is now um, providing that actually on a public website and encouraging people to um, use that code and share it. So share the code um, with anybody that you think um, might have been impacted. Um, how much time can we take off work to do the experience? I'm, so I'm not encouraging you to take time off from work. What I'm encouraging people to do is on work time, we think that it should take anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. Um, to actually fill out the information. So um, that, is, that is sort of the expectation, but it might take longer depending on how many people you're doing it for. Um, 
I think if you saw minor children have their own code, I, or have their own um, link, and you should make sure that you're taking a look at that. Um, can I share more about what got hacked? What I can share is what is publicly available right now, um, which is, you know, we do believe but um, that the information includes but is not limited to birthdays, home addresses, telephone numbers, social security numbers, and bank account information. It is very serious. Um, and again, that is just what we, um, it is, it, it, that is the information that we know, but it's not limited. We're still continuing um, to do forensics and it will take quite a bit of time um, before we really understand the extent, uh, which is why we're encouraging everyone um, to go ahead and sign up for the Experian website. Um, can we expect more guidelines? Um, okay, that's a different question. Um, I'm just making sure. Uh, two, great question, Susan, about language translations. Thank you. Um, actually, Berkeley pushed really hard for the current Spanish translation that is up on the UCOP website. Um, we have heard that they are looking at additional translations. We have been pushing hard for um, a, uh, a, a, a Chinese, basic Chinese um, translation as well. Um, but other campuses and other um, you know, sites may need different translations. They are aware that this needs to happen, but UCOP is working on translating um, those, the letter. Unfortunately, the Experian website is in English, which means that we are encouraging people who need help to, to have someone with them who can help them navigate the site um, so that they can actually understand what information they're supposed to be answering and can do that accurately. Any other questions in the chat, please go ahead. Um, but other than that, again, I would encourage you to um, take, some, take this seriously, um, sign up, spend some time like I did. Um, I did it last night, but you know, maybe after this, uh, the, not now, not right now, because we still have really good stuff to listen to. Um, but certainly even after this site, this uh, town hall, it might be the first thing that you uh, wanna take a look at as you uh, get back to your regular business day. All right. Thank you, Mark. Great. Thanks, Jen. That's really helpful. And um, uh, my wife and I did the same thing. We, we took time this week. It does take a little bit of time. You have to have your paperwork ready, bank accounts, credit cards, um, driver's license, passports. Everything has to be sort of in hand to, to put into the account. But it, I definitely encourage everyone to do it. And Jen, there's still some more questions in there that hopefully you can provide answers for including there was one a question about Experian being hacked at one point. So if you could address those, that would be extremely helpful. Um, next up are John Arvin and Wendy Hillis, who are going to talk about our Anchor House project. Wendy, John. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen here. Can everybody see that? Yes. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. I was going to share with you today um, our Anchor House project. It's one of several student housing projects that we've got underway. Uh, the Anchor House project will be located on the Full City Block, just across the street from campus, bounded by Oxford University, Walnut, and Berkeley Way. It's just across the street from the West Crescent. Um, this very generous donor has uh, wanted to prioritize the Anchor House project for transfer students. It's a population that uh, is historically underserved by our campus housing. Um, proceeds from this building will also fund annual scholarships. We estimate approximately 175 scholarships will be funded out of proceeds from this building. They will be uh, targeted for uh, first generation college students um, and other underrepresented populations. Um, you've probably all heard me talk about our goals for housing, our overall goal is to build uh, nearly 10,000 new student beds. And this project will deliver 772 of them, um, a significant percentage of our overall goal. Uh, the design team is headed up by uh, a well-known architect out of New York, Morris Adjmi. We've also got a local architect. The building will be uh, 526,000 
uh, square feet. As I mentioned, it'll include 772 beds. There will be about 15,000 feet of ground floor commercial along the perimeter of the building. And I'll show you a couple of renderings of the building here in a minute. Um, this is a very generous gift that we're being provided. Uh, all of the design, all of the construction will be paid for by the donor. Once the building is completed, it'll be turned over to us to run. Um, and as I mentioned, we will uh, be funding scholarships out of the surplus proceeds from the building. This is a rendering of the building. These are just massings. This is not architecture, but the anchor house massing is depicted there in gray to show the size and scale of the building when completed. Uh, we've compared that to two new buildings that are currently being built in the city of Berkeley, just to give you some context. That uh, center blue building is the new Marriott Hotel that's uh, under construction now. And here's that same massing uh, uh, viewed uh, towards the west. It's a significant building. Here's a good picture of it. So it's gonna be 14 stories tall. Uh, the main entrance is gonna be there on Oxford Street. You can see it a little bit in the center of the building off of the street. This is also a good uh, perspective to kind of explain how the building will work. On the ground floor, uh, the double story height that you see along the perimeter, that will be all the retail. That retail will be open to the public. Um, then the second floor, which is kind of that double height story that you see here um, on the corner, it's that full height, that's the second level. In order to get to the second level, you'll enter into this main lobby and go up an elevator or stairs to get to the second level. The second level will be open to anybody with a Cal ID. So it'll be students that live in the building, students that don't live in the building, and faculty and staff will all be permitted to go into the second level of this building. We're calling that the Cal Public. In the second level, there'll be uh, a cafe, there'll be a, a gym, there's some maker space. They are building what is called the locker room. And that is intended for transfer students that commute into campus to be able to lay down their backpacks and hang out in between classes. Um, there will be a teaching kitchen for RCNR. And we are also going to uh, locate an art design studio in there, similar to the art design studio that's on campus now. And then floors three through 14 will all be student residences. Um, these will all be apartment style. They will be four, four students per, um, per unit. Each student will have a private bed. These are some more renderings of, uh, of the building. You'll see here on the left, every third floor, there'll be balconies um, that, that uh, you can come out and look at views towards campus. There's the similar treatment on the west side. So there'll be these views uh, towards the bay. And then on the right, this is a close up of the corner. And this is the corner facing campus. And this is the cafe seating that you see here that's open. Here's a blow up of the Oxford frontage. This is the ground floor, floor retail here. This is the main entry into the building, quite nice. A quick shot of the landscape intended. There'll be um, perimeter landscaping in the public right of way in the second floor. The building is gonna be built in the shape of a donut, taking up the whole city block. So there'll be a core in the middle that's open to light and air. And on the second floor, there'll be actually a courtyard. There's a rendering in here in a minute that I'll show you. There are a couple of um, outdoor locations on the 13th floor, one facing campus, one facing the Northwest. These will be used for uh, special, event, uh, special events. And then finally, there'll be a rooftop deck with some uh, a vegetable garden. Here's some more renderings. This is the cafe on the second floor. This is the rooftop deck concept. And this is the interior courtyard here. Here are some renderings of the inside of the building, the lobby, the gym that I mentioned, some of the maker space that we intend to build. Again, this is all being funded by this very generous donor. And then finally, a quick timeline on where we are. So we've been working very diligently over the last couple of years. We started approximately two years ago. Since that time, we've been to the Capital Planning Committee, an internal process. We've gotten a couple of approvals there. We've been to the Design Review, Design Review Committee 
on four different occasions. We've been to the Regents twice. Um, and we are preparing ourselves to go to the Regents one final time this July for project approval. And we intend to start construction shortly thereafter. Construction will take us uh, a little over two years and we hope to be open for um, business in the fall of 2024. So that's all I have today. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to follow up. You can send me an, e an email and I'd be happy to follow up with you. Thank you, Mark. Great, thanks, John. This is such a phenomenal project. Um, next up is our Chancellor, Chancellor Christ. Um, is Carol here? Great, and Dan Mogoff too. Sorry about that, Dan. No worries at all. I'm not the attraction by any stretch of the imagination. So we'll jump right in. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, Carol, thanks for joining us today. Let's... Oh, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and good to see so many people virtually. <laughs> and hopefully soon physically. Um, let's start with one of the bigger elephants in the room. We got a lot of questions and I'm gonna to try to condense them into some big buckets and perhaps the biggest bucket of all is the budget. Where do we stand right now? It seems like we've had a lot of federal money flowing out to pu pu public higher education and to Berkeley. It seems that we're, people are talking about you know, coming out of the worst times. Has our situation improved? Are we past the challenges? What's the forecast? What's the current status? Yeah, thanks for that uh, for that question, Dan. Uh, yes, indeed, we've had some quite good budget news over the last um, uh, several weeks. First of all, the state has restored the cut that it made in its allocation to the University of California, so that's very good news. And then we're receiving, as you said, very pretty substantial money from the last uh, two CARES Acts. Um, that said, there still really are some challenges. First of all, the CARES Act funding is one-time money. It's really going to help um, with some of our the areas, but housing and dining is the most important of them that have had huge losses in the past year, and we'll be able to make up those losses. The use of the CARES Act is quite restricted. It has to be directed toward specific pandemic, specifically pandemic related losses. And the state has restored our budget to the 1920 level. It's obviously 1920, I mean, 2021, not the 1920 level, the 2019, 2020 level. And it's clearly up later than that. And it, co it costs us just standing still about $50 million a year for salary increases and, and um, cost increases. Uh, we are therefore going to have to uh, continue the $65 million reduction in, our, um, in the uh, budgets of the units for another year. However, I'm happy to say that a furlough is off the table and we're using every bridging strategy we know because we think this is a V-shaped problem in our budget and that we should recover as, the, um, as we continue to recover from the pandemic and the economy continues to recover. So not to put too fine a point on it, but are we looking at many years, do you think, of pretty tough conditions and challenges another year? What, what do you see on the road ahead? What, we, what, what should our expectations be? I think we should be recovered by 2023. I mean, there, I, I wouldn't say it's it's going to be over like flipping a switch. I mean, there were still challenges in our budget even before the pandemic hit. We had just um, eliminated a $150 million structural deficit. And I like to say our budget was precariously balanced and the pandemic has really knocked us off balance. Uh, but we're working um, really uh, uh, very energetic uh, to uh, multiply and diversify revenue sources. And, uh, and as those revenues start kicking in, we'll be in better financial shape. I also really hope that the regions will take up um, uh, what's called cohort tuition, uh, tuition increase uh, that uh, only applies to the entering class. And then that tuition stays steady for all the years that that entering class is at Berkeley. And I think when we break Make this uh, tuition log jam um, that things will get much better. So, you know, I remember when the pandemic really began to take hold and the financial consequences for the campus became clear, 
you know, there were two priorities that you set. One was to protect the academic core, the academic excellence of the institution. The other was to see everything through an equity lens to protect the most vulnerable among our staff and among our students. How do you think we've been doing on those two fronts? I, I, we, we have certainly been striving to do well on those two fronts. Uh, I think that, I mean, I, I, I don't like to talk about US News and World Report rankings, but they just have come out for our graduate programs and Berkeley has done extraordinarily well as it usually does. I think our, it's not that our academic departments are not feeling the stress of this year in multiple ways, including financial ways, but I, we've been, our faculty recruiting is continuing to go well, our retention is continuing to go well. So I feel very good about our academic programs. The, um, the, 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 the pandemic has been a huge, uh, it has hugely exacerbated inequality. So mm. I use the phrase a lot, we're all in the same storm, we're not in the same boat. And I just think it's incredibly, incredibly difficult for some students, uh, for um, some staff, for some faculty, is the fact that school hasn't been in, in session, in live face-to-face -face session for over a year now, uh, that um, people are, so people are struggling with childcare, they're struggling with um, supervising remote instruction for their children. Um, many people are struggling with um, job loss, maybe not from UC, but from, uh, you know, a, a spouse might have lost a job or a child might have lost a job. And then, of course, people are struggling with illness, with, with the pandemic. So it's not an easy time. Thank you for that. Um, let's stay in the money realm for a second. We're in the midst of a capital campaign, and I think probably some might say this would be the worst of times to launch, but how's it going? What are you, what are you seeing? It's going extremely well. The, uh, we're at about $4.3 billion raised out of our $6 billion goal. Uh, I, I, one of the things I'm sure that you all have seen um, through just reading the papers, that uh, this, again, the pandemic has been an inequality amplifier. The very wealthy in this campaign are, um, are I, mean, I mean, during this pandemic are doing well. And um, people seem to be more motivated to be generous, more motivated to think about their legacy. And so I've been so moved and inspired by all of the alumni and um, other supporters of the university who have stepped forward with absolutely wonderful gifts like Anchor House that you were just, um, you were just hearing about, but many gifts for uh, emergency financial aid for our students, many, um, many, uh, gifts for um, for a financial aid for students for graduate fellowships. So I've been just really inspired by by our donors, and the campaign is going very well. And then to connect the first two questions, this always comes up when we talk about philanthropy. To what extent will the success of the capital, or could the success of the capital campaign, help alleviate some of the short term budgetary challenges, or am I mixing apples and oranges? I think you're mixing apples and oranges a little bit. I mean, certainly if we have more money for financial aid, that's really wonderful. If we have more money for graduate fellowships, that's really wonderful. But nobody gives us a gift to pay the utilities bill or to pay for price increases in supplies. That they're, they're, that's, those are really different buckets. Um, nobody pays to, um, to uh, pay for salary increases for staff. So the budgetary challenges remain, even though I'm really thrilled at the generosity of our donors. And it is, um, it is helping us make Berkeley as um, distinguished and excellent as it aspires to be. I'm going to change to the area of housing. We heard from our colleague John Arvin earlier about the wonderful uh, Gateway Project. What about the housing and the student housing initiative in general? And also, well, let's talk about in general about how things are progressing right now. Then I want to ask you about People's Park. Well, we're certainly moving forward with a number of uh, other housing projects. We're uh, developing a housing project for graduate students that will be an expansion of Albany Village. That's obviously down in, in Albany where University Village is now. 
Uh, we also are going to receive a gift of an apartment building in Emeryville for graduate students. That's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And another donor is really moved by the urgency of our student housing needs. And then, of course, we're continuing to plan for the People's Park project. So speaking of People's Park, it's been in the news quite a bit lately. There have been a few incidents of crime. There was a story about the homes of Berkeley administrators um, having been attacked or you know vandalized. Um, there's been some student activism and opposition to campus plans. I'm wondering if you're reconsidering it all and what you assess and what your thoughts are about the road, of he road ahead for the development of the park. I don't see how anyone who lives in Berkeley or indeed in the Bay Area um, cannot be um, troubled by the tragedy of homelessness that surrounds us everywhere. Um, the homeless population has really increased during the pandemic. And um, I believe that uh, Berkeley has a very important role to play in working with the city to try to create um, uh, more housing options for the homeless, uh, that, um, that we are um, in the plan for People's Park. First of all, we have a social worker on our, on our staff that is now successfully housed over 60 of the homeless um, people who uh, frequent the park. There are another 20 to 25 that are in progress toward being housed. Um, and uh, one of uh, the plan for People's Park is for to use a quarter of the site. It's 129 apartments with 180 beds for uh, permanent supportive housing for the homeless. This isn't a shelter. This is permanent supportive housing. The supportive means there'll be services in the building like medical services um, uh, that, um, that will be for the, the, the tenants of the building and also the larger um, unhoused population. Then a quarter of the site will be a park that I think will be unlike the current park, which is a hard place to imagine to um, take your kids to play um, or uh, have a really relaxing time in a park. But a quarter of it will be a park that will be in a beautiful design by Walter Hood uh, and that will um, both uh, commemorate the history of People's Park and I hope really be a People's Park. I think a lot about what does People's Park mean now, not in 1969, but now. And what People's Park means now, I think, is giving some of our resources to indeed help the people who are homeless and to have a park that really is like the park in 1969 was a resource for people. And then to help our students who desperately need housing by using half the site for housing. Thanks for that. You know, another thing that's been in the news is this uh, a new joint program with uh, between Mills and Berkeley, and there's been speculation about other grander plans. Where do things stand um, in terms of our relationship with Mills and our thinking about the future of that relationship? Well, I, I, I think all of us who, who, uh, who treasure li both liberal arts colleges and women's colleges, as I certainly do for my own education and from my experience at Smith, were very, very sad when Mills made the announcement that uh, this year's freshman class that's just been admitted will be the last class it will be admit and they'll only grant degrees for two more years. So Mills, like many um, uh, small colleges, uh, is um, was in fragile uh, financial condition before the pandemic and the pandemic has made what was a difficult path um, seem impossible. Um, so we're very much in discussion with Mills. It's too easy, early to say what those conversations will lead to. Uh, it's uh, obviously would be a very complex transaction if there were some kind of association uh, between Mills and the University of California. Got it. Um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, you talked about the extent to which the pandemic both amplified and exacerbated racial and socioeconomic uh, inequities. And of course, it was in May that we witnessed in horror the murder of George Floyd. Many of those memories are coming back due to the trial. Um, I'm wondering where things stand on our own campus. Some of the efforts that were perhaps added fuel, where fuel was added 
in the wake of both uh, George Floyd's murder and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, specifically reimagining community safety. Where do things stand with um, the campus and UCPD right now? Well, they, they're um, the uh, Independent Advisory Board on Public Safety uh, this past summer uh, uh, issued a report uh, with, I think, about 100 recommendations. We've accepted almost every one of them, and we're in the process of, of implementing them. I think the most significant ones are the following. Um, the first is to stand up a team of mental health professionals who will be the first responders in wellness checks or mental health emergencies. So that's, I, I think, really good. I'm not sure the police, as, as, as fine as they are in many respects, are not always the best people to intervene in mental health um, emergencies. Uh, we've moved out of the police department a number of things that don't need to be there. Uh, our, our, our emergency um, uh, services program, emergency planning, um, the uh, fingerprinting operation, the keying operation, and things that uh, the um, uh, the Cleary Act compliance, we've moved out of the police department. There's a big conversation going on that's system-wide. There have been two day-long symposia that were whole, held on policing. I think that the system itself is going to come um, up with a set of uh, guidelines for campuses. But I think it's, it, it's a very important challenge, both to make sure that the police that we control, which is the police on this campus, it is, uh, it is, is um, uh, operates in, a, um, in an um, anti-racist manner, and that we have the set of public safety, um, uh, the public safety staffing, the public safety programs, the public safety protocol that makes everyone in the community safe and feel safe. We just, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead. Did, go ahead. No, so we just had somebody pose a question and whether we're still thinking of spending the large amount of money required to locate, to relocate UCPD. Uh, that's a, a, um, a question that we'll have to give some very careful thought to. Uh, when I originally um, uh, said uh, uh, I, I would try to relocate uh, um, the police department, I thought this would be easy. It turns out that it's going to be a very expensive proposition, so we'll have to think about that carefully and how it, um, what the best use of that money is, even within the realm of public safety. I also want to hop back to the budget because a couple of questions popped up. And even though we have just a few minutes left, I want to do want to be responsive. Related to the budget, two separate questions. People wondering, saying, no, I don't really want furloughs, but why are they off the table given the challenges the in terms of operating budget? And why is there going to be a salary increase? And this person says, I, I like salary increases, but why are we having them now? So sort of two different areas, people wondering about why we've taken those arrows out of our quiver, so to speak. Well, I think a furlough was always a last resort. I, uh, I, I, I don't think, it, I mean, it's a salary cut by another name, basically. And I, I think people at the, on the Berkeley campus are extraordinarily skilled. They work incredibly hard and I wanna see them fairly compensated and, uh, and especially feel that um, it, it, that it was a, it, it, it was a real um, sacrifice this year that our non-represented staff did not get salary increases. And I'm eager to see salary increases return next year and certainly don't want to be um, giving with one hand and taking away with the other. Makes sense. So we have about three minutes left. I would like to step back with you for one second. You know, I'm wondering what you've learned. This has been an incredible year. What you've learned about the staff and the campus in the last year and how your thinking may have changed about the road ahead, about the possibility of lasting change. So maybe some reflection and some help us see what you're seeing as we look down the road. I think one of the things I've learned is how extraordinary our campus is. I, I, this has um, been a, 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 um, a crisis that has tried us all. And I'm just so every day so thankful and inspired by the creativity, 
by the resilience, by the imagination, by the dedication of staff. So I want to say thank you to all of you for what has been incredible work in an incredibly trying year. So I, one of the things that I've learned is that a time of crisis can also be a time of great um, creativity and, and, and ferment, creative ferment. Um, and so I, one of the things I've learned personally is how you lead when you don't know what the next day is gonna <laughs> bring. And there's this co combination of both a need for decisiveness and yet a willingness to be able to adapt on the fly as conditions on the ground change is what we know um, changes. But I really hope that um, the trying conditions that we've all been subject to this year will lead us to some better ways of working. I, I hope that remote work is not a thing of the past when the pandemic ends, but that we will have more um, hybrid uh, arrangements for work. I hope that um, remote instruction is going to be a very important arrow in our quiver, help us to um, uh, extend the incredible benefits of a Berkeley education to more people, enable students to have something that I've been calling elasticity of place, whereby they could take up an internship and still uh, make progress on, on, their, um, on, their, uh, on their coursework. So I, I do think this has been a time of, um, of real creative ferment in addition to crisis. And that's certainly one of the things I'm taking away from it. And one of the things that I wanna, want to have stay with us. I, I think it would be very sad to say that this crisis had not brought us to some better ways of doing things and to some real benefits as, as an institution. And I'm wondering in some, do you feel confident about the university's future or somewhat trepidatious given all these changes and challenges? I feel incredibly confident about the university's future. I, I just, it, it, I, the, the people here, which is what the university is, are just extraordinary. So I wanna, again, end with thanks to all of you. Um, and I want to say well, just one quick thing to correct a misapprehension that came up in the chat. We're not actually spending university money to house the homeless. We have an employee who helps connect those who are unhoused in the park with city and county services. Right. And I will bounce back and say, Chancellor Chris, thank you very, very much for your time and for your efforts over this past year and your leadership. And as they say, back to you in the studio, Mark. Dan and Carol, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, there was a question about whether this was being recorded. It was being re recorded. I think it was also a request that we have uh, some sort of meeting like this to talk about the experience uh, business in more detail. And I will leave that to Jen Stringer and Eugene perhaps to figure out what that might be shaped like, but I think it's a very good idea. Um, Bill, anything I missed that I should say at the end here? I think we're good. Just. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thanks, everybody. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.